you know, I'm really not interested in Medicare for all. I'm just all about Medicare for me. <laughs> and it's already begun. Um, I'm so glad you all came out tonight because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And my, my philosophy is when all that stuff's going on, sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta laugh. And so tonight I hope we can all kind of laugh a while because if you don't, I've sort of, I've sort of wasted my time. <laughs> so I hope we all laugh a lot tonight. Um, I've learned in life how important it is to be able to laugh at things because things have happened to me through my life. I met my husband 45 years ago. We've been together ever since. I met him 45 years ago at a service station. His car was on one rack. My car was on the other rack. And we've had car trouble together ever since then. <laughs> when we first got married, we had a little MG Midget to drive. Anybody remember MG Midgets? Well, I mean, they're about that big. So we had these little, this little MG Midget. We went on our honeymoon in that. We had so much fun with that. And then a while later, I got pregnant. And my daddy said, you, here's an important lesson for you to learn. You don't ever need to have more kids than you got seats in your car. So since we only had two seats and there was two of us, we traded that car in and we got us a brand new 1978 Monte Carlo. Light blue with a dark blue Landau top. Anybody know what a Landau top is? You're as old as I am. <laughs> a Landau top, it was beautiful. We lived in a little town named Leeds, Alabama. And when you lived in Leeds in that day, it was a big deal for somebody to get a brand new car. And so we were anxious to show off our brand new car. And so we went after church on Sunday night, we went to everybody, where everybody went for church after church on Sunday night. And that was to the Pizza Hut. So we showed up at the Pizza Hut and everybody in town was there. And we walked in just so proud of our new car. And so we were telling everybody, we got a new car, we got a new car. So when we got ready to leave, all our friends lined up at the windows watching us as we drove off in our new car. Well, we had happened to get the front parking place right next to the windows. And when we came out, something amazing happened. Now, I have to back up and tell you this, because my husband and I have always been able to find fun things to do that were cheap, because we always been poor. <laughs> Down south, we call it poor. And so, like we did things like before there was a lot of airport security, we would go to the airport in Birmingham and we'd go down to the gates and then I'd pretend like I was getting off. I'd get in line with people getting off a plane and I'd pretend like I was getting off a plane and he would be at the end and he would see me and he'd say, hey, and he'd hug me, he'd run and we'd hug each other and, and then we'd switch it around and he got off the plane and then I would run. So, we, you know, we've had a long series of doing this through the years, so we were into a new game at that time called I Got a Pull Through. And what that is is when you get a pull through in a parking lot, that's a big deal. I'd come home and I'd say, I got a pull through today. He'd say, I got a pull through today. We counted our pull throughs. And that night when we came out of that restaurant, that car was parked right in front of the windows and we had a pull through. The car in front of us had left. So not only were they gonna get to see our new car, they were gonna get to see us go forward in our new car. So we got in our car, he put it in drive. I said, we gotta pull through. He put that car in drive and he gunned it and we went. <laughs> Cause we forgot that there was one of those curbs <laughs> right there in front of us. And so everybody kind of laughed. And he said, well, what should I do? Should I back it up now? I said, no, you've already done it now. I said, you might as well just keep it in drive and just keep driving. So he said, okay, so he gunned it again. And we went, <laughs> again, because we had not remembered that the, car, the park in front of us would also have one of those curbs. So now we are straddled two of those curbs. 
And he said, well, what should I do? I said, well, you've done it. Now we got to bounce twice either way. So he put it in gear, and we went. And all our friends just laughed and laughed and laughed. Well, we kept that Monte Carlo for a few years, and then we had a couple of kids. And we decided we needed a minivan. So we got us a Ford Aerostar minivan. Man, that thing was pretty. And, and so we drove that thing till the wheels were coming off of it. And one night we were driving through town, and I don't know how to describe this to you, except to just say that that car became possessed by demons. It was the craziest thing you've ever seen. All of a sudden, though, we had electric windows. All of a sudden, the windows started going up and down. And then the door locks started going just up and down, up and down. And then the lumbar support started inflating and deflating and inflating and deflating. So here we are, car windows going up and down, inflating and deflating. And all of a sudden, my son from the back seat said, Daddy, this car's on fire. And we looked, and there's black smoke just billowing out of the back of it. And I said, what are we going to do? And he said, I'll think of something. <laughs> Could you think quickly, please? So he pulled it over to the edge, and he said, I'm just going to turn it off. And I thought, yeah, that'll fix it. So he turned it off. Well, when he tried to crank it, of course, it did nothing. But there were a couple of guys coming by. They saw us. They stopped. They jumped us off. The car started, and we headed home. And he said, if I can get this car to the dealership tomorrow, I'm going to trade it in. Okay? Now, I had to go to work. So I followed him in my beat-up old car and followed him, left him at the dealership because he made it there. I said, you do whatever you feel like you need to do. I went on to work. When I got home that night, this man had bought a Ford Ranger pickup truck. <laughs> it didn't have an extended cab. It had two seats in it, one for him, and I guess the other one was for me. And we had to go on a six-hour trip to my parents the next weekend. And I said, why did you buy this truck? He said, that would be a good work truck for me. I said, it's our good car. Mine won't make it on trips. What do you think you're going to do with our children when we have to drive six hours next week? He said, I've been thinking about this. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> he said, here's what we're going to do. He said, it's got a camper shell. I looked at him, and I said, that's metal, right? He said, yeah. I said, it's August, right? He said, yeah. I said, you're going to put our children in a metal box in August and drive them for six hours? He said, yeah. I said, what are they going to sit on? He said, I already figured that out, too. Oh, gosh. I said, what? He said, I bought some bean bags. <laughs> I looked at those bean bags, and they were vinyl. Vinyl bean bags in a metal box in August for six hours. Well, we did it. <laughs> we put our kids in the back. truck on those bean bags and we headed off. We were about 30 miles down the road and I turned around and looked. My daughter had long brown hair and it was just stringing down, just soaking wet. I looked at my son, his face was red as a beet. And I said, Tim, our children are dying. <laughs> and he said, I'll think of something. <laughs> oh, God. So he pulls off and goes into Walmart. We put the kids up in the front seat with me so they could get cooled off. And he went into Walmart. About 30 minutes later, he came out. He had a bag. Inside that bag was a roll of duct tape. Of course, no man is going to go into Walmart to get something, to fix something, without getting duct tape. <laughs> so he got duct tape, and the other item was dryer vent. Dryer vent. That, round tube things. 
He came out to that car, and I thought, what in the world is he doing? He took that dryer vent and put it on the air vent for the air conditioner, and he taped it all the way around. And then he opened the window from the cab going back into the, to the camper shell, and he opened the window on the camper shell, and he sent that tube through. And he said, y'all suck on this. <laughs> So, we go down the road, and about an hour later, I looked in the back seat, and this looked in the camper shell, and this is what I saw. Give it to me! Give it to me! It's my turn to breathe! Give it to me! Oh, bless him. He has stayed with me all these years, which is amazing, considering that I kid around with him so much. He... Um, he had a hard life growing up. His daddy told him he needed, he went to the dentist and they told him he needed braces. And his daddy said, we ain't got the money for braces. He said, you just sit around and while you're watching TV, you just push on your teeth. <laughs> he said, I'd be sitting there at night and daddy would say, push on them teeth, boy. He said, I just, I, he said, Till I was about 18, I had permanent dents in my finger <laughs> from pushing on my teeth. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you never know what he's going to do. He went to the Holy Land a while back. And uh, while he was in Bethlehem, he was at the scene where uh, they believed Jesus was born in a manger. And as he was looking, he bent down. And when he bent down, his glasses came off and slid up under it. And the man said, I'm going to get these for you. Don't touch anything. So he reached up under and got them for him, and he put them back on, and he walked around for the rest of the day, and he kept saying, everything seemed blurred. And finally, somebody walked up to him and said, you're missing a lens <laughs> out of your glasses. So I'm thinking maybe 200 years from now, they're going to do some kind of archaeological dig and find that and say, wow, they had glasses back in Jesus' time. But um, anyway, so he had to go without his glasses. So he was on the square in Marietta, Georgia, where we live, and they, they had some very small parking places. And he tried to pull his big old truck in. He don't have the Ranger anymore. It's got a big truck now. So he tried to pull that big old truck into one of those small parking places and couldn't do it. And this man said, hey, there's some bigger parking places right over there. And Tim said, thanks, thanks. So when he moved his truck, when he got out, he saw that man again. And so he said to that man, he said, thank you for telling me about these parking places. And by the way, thank you for your service. The man looked at him kind of funny. And he said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And Tim said, oh, my, he said, my grandson's a Marine now. We got a grandson-in-law that's, that's in the Air Force. And I just appreciate the military so much. Thank you for your service. And the man said, I'm sorry, but I still don't know what you're talking about. And Tim said, your hat, thank you for your service. He said, that's the heating and air company I work for. <laughs> Tim said, thank you for your service. We all need heating and air. <laughs> but he loves me, and he says sometimes, he'll say, you know, if anything ever happened to you, I'd never get married again. I said, Tim Childers, you wouldn't last a day without a wife. He said, no, seriously, seriously. If anything happened to you, I'd never get married again. I said, this right here is how you'll pray at my funeral. <laughs> With one eye open, look at my replacement. He said, yeah, I probably would. He said, I'll probably walk over to your casket, get a flower and take it to some woman and say, would you accept this rose? <laughs> A few years ago, uh, I got really into wave runners. I like things that go real fast. I'm not impressed with jewelry. I'm not impressed with furs. But man, you give me something that goes fast, and I love it. So I got into wave runners because they go fast on the water. First experience I had with the wave runner was down in Panama City, Florida when my husband, who's a pastor now, was a youth minister, and he took a group down there. And there was a guy that was uh, in college that went with us, 
good looking guy. And he rented a wave runner. And he went all up and down that beach on that wave runner. And when he came back in, I said, would you mind taking me for a ride on that? He said, no, sure, get on. I got on, put my arms around him. <laughs> we went out in the ocean and we just rode up and down. It was so much fun. All of a sudden, that thing went dead. Dead as a doornail, dead. And he said, we're going to have to get off. I said, into the water? He said, yeah. I said, that's where the sharks live. I ain't getting in that water. He said, you got to. I got to turn it over and get the seaweed out of it. So we got into the water. He turned it over and he pulled the seaweed and pulled the seaweed. And then he sat it back up. And he got on it. And he reached back to get me. And he couldn't get me on there. I ain't saying it was my fault. He was very weak. <laughs> And he kept pulling and kept pulling and finally he got me on there. But the whole time I was in that water, I was thinking, if we die out here and our bodies get washed ashore, everybody's going to walk by and say, what is that old woman doing with that young, good looking boy? <laughs> but anyway, we finally got up, got me on it. And then he reached down to crank it. Wouldn't crank. And I just about panicked. And he said, no, 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 no problem. He said, I know what the problem is. I said, what? He said, I don't have the kill switch in. I said, what's the kill switch? And he showed me, and he had dangling from his arm a little cold cord. And at the end of it was a little plastic key. And he said, if this key is not inserted into that slot, this won't start. I said, what's the purpose of that? He said, well, it's so if you're riding and you fall off the wave runner, the wave runner will stop because that'll come out. It's pretty good. I learned a lesson that day. So my next experience with the wave runner was many years later, and I was at a retreat with a bunch of women, and the woman, the woman that owned the home had wave runners. So we got out there on the river, and she showed me how to do all this cool stuff like whirly dips and slides and all this stuff. And man, I learned all these tricks. But Tim wasn't there to see it. So a few months later, we went on a cruise, and I said, I want to do an excursion where we can ride wave runners so I can show you what I can do. He said, okay. So we chose an excursion called the Everteen Cool Beach Break. Everteen Cool. Now, he went and rented the wave runner, and in my defense, I was not there to hear the instructions. So what happened is not my fault. I am innocent. After we rode around all day with him driving, I said, would you let me drive this and show you some of the things I know how to do on the wave runner? He said, all right. So he sat on the, with a, on the beach and he watched me as I pulled out. Now, I'm going to remind you again, I didn't hear the instructions. And I didn't hear that man when he said, don't go over there. If you go over there, you'll be arrested. I did not hear that. Well, over there was the cruise ship. And there might be some people on that cruise ship that would want to see me do all my tricks too. So when I got on that wave runner, I took off and went over that way. I got out there and I did all kind of little whirly dips and spins and everything. And when I looked back, everybody on the beach was going like this. I thought this cheering me on. And so I waved back. Hey, how y'all doing? Woo, ain't this fun? About that time, that man that ran the place got on his wave runner, and he came out there just bellowing out there to me. And he got even with me, and he said, did you not see me wave at you? I said, yeah, did you see me waving back? And he said, you're going to jail. And I said, what? <laughs> so he, we came on into shore. My husband was standing there, and he looked at me, and he said, you see that ship over there? I said, yeah. He said, I'm getting on it. And I will leave you here to rot in this jail. I said, you can't leave me here. You a preacher. What do they say about you if you leave me here in a jail? So, so he went over and talked to the man. The man said, 
Okay, if you'll get her out of here right now, you can take her. So <laughs> we start walking back to the ship, and the first thing on my mind is I wanted to look at that guy and say, well, apparently not everything is cool. Because <laughs> that wasn't what you just did. So we got back from our cruise, and a year or so later, we bought a house on a lake. And I said, let's buy us our own wave runners. So we did. We bought two bright red wave runners. Those kinds that's got the rooster tail coming out of the back that the water comes up. And we rode those things all summer long. Had a ball on them. And at the end of the summer, to get them out of the water, we had a process. We were 72 steps from our house down to the lake. And here's what we did. The, the boat launch was over this way. So Tim said, here's what I'll do. I'll come down and get everything prepped to get the wave runners out of the water. Then I'm going to drive the car over to the boat launch. And you ride one wave runner over there and then put me on the back and come back and we'll get the other one. I said, okay. He took the phones. He took everything like that. And I kept the key to both wave runners. Well, he left, but before he left, he looked at me and he said, do not unhook this wave runner from this dock until you make sure it's gonna start. I said, okay. He turned around and walked up. I just reached over and unhooked it. And I got, it was on the main stream of the river, so it just sort of pulled me out into the river. And I start floating down the river and I reached down to crank it, nothing. Dead. And I'm like, oh, golly, I'm dead. No, I'm just dead. And, and it was taking me so quickly down the river. And remember, I'd given him the phones. I couldn't call him. And even if I called him, I had the key to both wave runners with me, so he didn't have any way to come and get me. So I'm just floating down the river. And I floated up under the neighbor's pier. And I got up under that pier, and I grabbed hold of it. And I held on to that pier for 30 minutes before he realized something's wrong. And then finally I see him and he walks down 72 steps and he comes out to the end of my pier and he can't see because I'm up under the neighbor's pier. And he comes out and he does this. And I said, hey, he didn't hear me. So I took the edge of that thing and I pulled myself out from under that pier. And I looked over and I said, hey, by this time I'm floating again rapidly. And he said, what are you doing? I said, it wouldn't start. Everybody in this room knows what he said next. I told you not to unhook it from the dock until you made sure it was going to start. Well, it made me so mad. So I just reached up and I said, well, what do you expect me to do? And about that time, I saw that kill switch <laughs> on that cord dangling. And I remembered what that young man had taught me so many years before, that that wave runner will not start unless that plastic key is in that slot. And I saw it about the same time he saw it. And the look on his face would have him arrested. <laughs> he was so mad. And I reached down and I put the key in the slot and I cranked it and I drove by as I watched him stomping up 72 steps. And the thought that went through my mind was, he has a completely different idea in his mind for the term kill switch. <laughs> This has now extended down to my children. My daughter, when she was 16, she wanted a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses. I said, I'm not paying $130 for you a pair of sunglasses. So she worked all summer. She made her money to get her Ray-Ban sunglasses. And on July the 4th, we went to a big event out in a park with 20,000 people there. And when she had to go to the porta potty, she had her glasses attached right here, and when she leaned over, her glasses fell into the porta potty. 
she went outside and she asked a policeman, would you help me? He said, no. <laughs> but he gave her his flashlight. So she took that big old flashlight up under her arm and went running around until she found a man. And she said to this man, I have dropped my sunglasses in the porta potty. Would you please get them out? And the man went over there and reached his hands into that porta potty and found her sunglasses and came out and handed them to her and she went, ew, how ungrateful can you be? So he took them in the bathroom and washed them for her and brought them back out and gave them to her. The end of the summer, she was eating at a little restaurant in that town and she had braces. So she had a retainer with her. And she took off her retainer to eat and put it on a tray. And when she put it on that tray, when she got ready to leave, she dumped the tray into the garbage can. In the garbage can went the retainer. So she asked her boyfriend who was with her, would you get that out? And he said, no, I'm not getting that out. So she looks over in the corner. There is a man sitting in the corner, and only my daughter could talk somebody twice into doing something like this for her. So she looked over at this man, and she said, I've dropped my retainer in the garbage. She pour it on when she needs to. So he walked over there. He went through the garbage. He got it. He handed it to her, and she said, thank you. I appreciate that so much. He said... That ain't nothing, honey. July 4th, I was down at the park, and a girl dropped her sunglasses in the port. I said, did you tell him it was you? She said, no. <laughs> no. So the moral of this story is, no matter what happens in life, sometimes you just got to laugh. Thank you so much. This has been fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching my show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now it's your opportunity to show me that you liked it, and you can do that with these buttons right down here. There's some buttons where you can send me a tip, and the reason why I want you to do that is because when I got here, I rented me a red convertible VW Beetle, and I had so much fun with it that I want to have one of my own, and you can contribute toward that, and then I can have fun every day of my life. Thank you again for watching. I really had a good time.